to this session. Uh, I hope I can entertain you during breakfast today and I will not bore you too much. Um, I'm Angela, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Albert Einstein College in uh, New York City. Um, and um, today I'm very happy to be here to present some of the data that um, we obtained in a project uh, mainly related to type 1 diabetes in which the overarching aim was to find novel treatment for, um, for this disease. Um, just want to give you a brief uh, introduction. I'm, I'm sure most of you know what is um, type 1 diabetes. Um, uh, but um, I want to point out that both uh, prevalence and uh, incidence of type 1 diabetes uh, significantly increase uh, in the past um, 30 years. Um, now there are 1.6 million Americans with uh, this disease, and that includes 200,000 uh, young adults less of um, 25, uh, 20 years old. Um, so the, 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 the therapy for this disease did not uh, significantly change over the past 100 year. And um, it's mainly based on uh, insulin replacement therapy, uh, which is often uh, complex, uh, painful, and challenging. And the majority of patients um, that are on insulin still don't achieve the American Diabetes Association glycemic target. And even when they do so, um, they, they still have the, the mortality of match control. And the, the key point that I wanted to make in, in this slide is that um, beta cell replacement alone will not be able to treat type 1 diabetes. And then the, the fact that we need a specific immune therapy in order to prevent beta cell uh, death, especially in the first, uh, in the early phases of the disease, um, represent to us a very important unmet need. So in order to prevent and eventually delay uh, the, the death of beta cell, especially in the early phases of type 1 diabetes, we targeted a specific complex called the HLA-DQ8 insulin 23 complex. So um, as probably you, you already know, the, this um, disease is mainly characterized by um, destruction of uh, pancreatic beta cells. And um, the reason why we choose to target specifically this complex is because the presentation of islet autoantigen by the HLA class 2 molecule to T cells is a very important critical step, is a very important step in, in beta cell death. And um, one of the most important HLA class 2 molecule is called uh, um, HLA-DQ8 and uh, is um, one of the um, most important genes associated with the disease. Moreover, the um, insulin B923, uh, also called INS B923, is a major autoantigen in, um, in the disease. Uh, we can also say that it is uh, upstream of other antigens and um, is indeed presented by the HLA-DQ8 to T cells. So again, the, the aim of this study was then to um, target uh, this complex, uh, which we believe is a fundamental uh, disease driver, in order to present the beta cell function, and then um, eventually lessen and or prevent um, the dependence from insulin, which, I mean, we know now is the cost is very, very high of insulin. So um, we did try to target this complex with different uh, molecules used in therapeutics, and I'll go over some of them that uh, were used in this study. Um, but we did find that the most significant results um, were with um, peptides. So, I just want to go over um, some of the molecules that were uh, used in this study. So in general, um, as a therapeutic molecule, uh, you can use small molecule, large molecule, or peptide. Um, the um, problem with small molecule, um, an example of a small molecule is, for example, aspirin, uh, is that they have broad distribution, they usually have very long half-life, um, and they are not, not always specific. So that can generate um, some off-target effects that can be, of course, 
problematic. Uh, large molecule, um, for example, mm, very hot large molecules now are monoclonal antibodies. They cannot be taken um, orally. Uh, they do not mm, penetrate the cells, and they can only target uh, surface uh, proteins. Uh, and of course, they are highly antigenic. On the contrary, um, peptides are um, more specific compared to small molecule and large molecule. They, can, they are able to penetrate the cells. They are um, less antigenic compared, for example, to monoclonal antibody. And it generally is easier and cheaper to synthesize a peptide compared, again, to small and large molecule. Uh, but the problem that um, scientists have to face when you use um, peptides is their short half-life and, um, and, again, the, the limited bioavailability. So in order to overcome this problematic, we, instead of using regular peptide, specifically in, in this project, um, we used retro, what is called a retro inverso peptide. Uh, for those of you that are not um, familiar with this term, these peptides have the um, inverse sequence of the um, parental peptide, and they are also made by um, D amino acids instead of L amino acids. And both of these characteristics um, gave them uh, an increased um, enzymatic stability, so they are more resistant to proteases. Uh, they have a longer plasma half-life. They are less immunogenic, and um, they have a higher affinity to the target, in this case, the HLADQ8, compared to regular uh, peptides. Uh, we should also mention that um, they can act as signaling molecules, and it's, um, again, last but not least, it's relatively easy to create a panel of retroinverso peptides uh, in order to target multiple epitopes. And of course, it's, this is very important for uh, a disease like type 1 diabetes because there is a plethora of neo-autoantigen involved, uh, especially in, in patients. So in order to um, find uh, retroinverso peptides that were able to um, prevent or delay the, the, the death of beta cell during uh, the, the very early phases of um, the disease, we created a pipeline um, including uh, four different phases um, in which the first um, two phases um, included uh, some in vitro screening and validation in order to find what was the heat and lead molecule. And then phase three and phase four um, were mainly ex vivo and in vitro val validation of the uh, confirmed lead. Um, so I, in, in the interest of time, um, most of my slides um, will be uh, related on phase uh, three and phase four, because I really wanted to show you what happened when you use this kind of molecule in mice in vivo and in um, human cells isolated from patients with type 1 diabetes. But um, I just want to mention that in phase one, what was done was an in, in silico screening of um, um, potential retroinverso peptide that were able to displace the binding between HLADQ8 and INSBINAN23. And I, I do want to mention that, as you can see here in, I don't know if you can, okay, the pointer doesn't work well. But um, as you can see here in this um, figure, the parental peptide that we used in order to um, generate retroinverso peptides uh, was the insulin B923. And I'll, I'll go back just to explain a little bit better why we specifically pick this peptide. And um, um, briefly, what we found was that among hundred of um, retroinverso peptides that were uh, screened, two of them, called RICT and RIEXT, um, did um, show some promising results, at least in vitro in cells. So, um, as I said, I just wanted to go back a little bit to, 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 um, to better um, tell you why we, we picked this uh, specific insulin 23 peptide. The, the name insulin 23 pep peptide comes from the fact that um, it's, um, um, it belongs 
to the uh, beta chain of insulin and it spans from amino acid 9 to amino acid uh, 23. And it, it's, it's a very, for, for people that um, study diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes, it's a very well-known um, peptide um, and there are many studies done um, in mice and in humans. And I, I just want to mention a few facts that are important to understand um, our data in the next slide. So uh, most of the islets that are infiltrated T cells in a mouse model of type 1 diabetes called the NOD mouse model um, do react to insulin 23 um, and um, in humans, T cells that, um, so in, in most patients uh, with a new diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, T cells are able to respond to insulin 23. And um, also T cell clones that are uh, targeting in SBN23 can cause diabetes in immunodeficient mice. And also, again, I wanted to go back to the main point here that um, um, it's known that this, and we, be, we strongly believe it, that in SBN23 is uh, upstream other autoantigens in type 1 diabetes, and that's also the reason why we wanted to specifically target it. Um, here I'm, I just wanted to show you how this uh, peptide is binding to the cleft of the um, MHC class 2 molecule called the HLADQ8. So this is a very um, tight binding. Um, so briefly, um, I just wanted to mention how we came up with the, the, the two um, retroinverse peptides called RICT and RIEXT. So in the very early phases of our uh, screening process, we used a human HLA DQ8 construct. This construct was made in a um, baculovirus system uh, and has um, both the alpha and beta chain of the HLA DQ8 is kept together by a FOS, a FOS and a um, June um, part. And um, of course, both alpha and beta are tagged with histidine and flag. So um, the, um, the essay that helped us to um, screen this peptide were, was a Delphia essay that was customized in, in our lab. I don't, I don't know if the, okay, it's okay. Um, and in, in, in this case, what we did was to put together the HLADQ8 and the insulin 23 with or without the, the um, retroinverse peptide that we wanted to screen. Um, and we use nickel coated plates because um, the construct is tagged with histidine, so it can um, bind the nickel uh, coated plates very well. And then the signal was revealed by a ropium streptavidin. So um, when we had retroinverse peptide um, inhibiting the binding between HLADQ8 and its BN23, this, this signal was significantly decreased. So among, as I said, among um, hundreds of peptides that were screened here, I'm just showing uh, the um, top 14 of them. The, um, the two that showed uh, a significant and um, constant inhibition of the formation of the complex uh, higher than 50% were RICT and RIXT. And that was also confirmed in a um, dose response essay. But then, we also wanted to see um, what happened when these um, molecules were used in a system in which the HLADQ8 was expressed. So in a system that uh, where um, we didn't use a, a construct, a human HLADQ8 construct, but in a system where the human HLADQ8 was expressed on the surf surface of uh, cells. So um, here we used a cell line, a B cell line um, called the BSM. Um, these cells are isolated from a um, patient um, that is homozygous for uh, HLADQ8 and do express on their surface the um, human HLADQ8 molecule that is able to hold the insulin 23. So the, the, the first thing that we wanted to show was that 
these um, human HLA-DQ8 expressed on the surface of these cells was able to uh, hold well the peptide. And we use a um, flow system in which the, um, we uh, first demonstrated that um, most of our cells were positive for DQ8. I'm sorry, the pointer doesn't work, but I hope you can appreciate it. Okay. Um, and then um, on the um, on the right, um, the the um, the population of uh, cells on the uh, upper right part is the population of cells that is DQ8 positive and is able to hold the the and 23 peptide. So what we wanted to show here was what happened when we use these um, two retroinversal peptides in the system. And then here, when we added RICT and RIXT to, to B cells uh, together with the NCBN23, you can appreciate on the bottom part that the percentage of cells, of um, HLA adequate positive cells that was holding the peptide was in the beginning almost 85% here. And then it goes down almost to 40% when we use the RICT, and it goes even further down when we use the RIXT. So this um, suggests us that we were also able to displace this binding I still in vitro, but in a system that had a, um, expressed the human HLADQ8. Then another um, experiment that we wanted to test was then to, to understand if both molecules were able to um, inhibit the, the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines in a functional uh, T-cell assay. So I'll walk you this um, assay because I think it's very, it's cool. So um, first we used the, um, as antigen presenting cell line, um, again, the, the cells that I just presented, the BSM cells that are uh, B cells. Um, expressing the human HLADQ8 on their surface that are holding the insulin 23 And then as responder T cells, um, we use a engineered murine um, T cell line that um, has a um, human uh, T cell receptor. And this human T cell receptor um, is uh, activated only when in CB923 is presented by the human HLADQ8. And the readout of this system is the um, uh, pro inflammatory cytokines interleukin 2, but um, we did test also other pro inflammatory cytokines. But in the interest of time, I will just show you the results um, that we got for, uh, insulin, uh, for interleukin 2. So again, I will uh, walk you um, through this uh, data. So um, okay. these data were uh, obtained um, through um, a specific Luminex assay um, in which we uh, measure the um, production of interleukin two um, cytokines. And as you can see, the, the black bar is the production of interleukin two when in this system um, only the insulin 23 is added. But then, if you look at the blue and the red bar, when in the system we added um, one of our molecules, the RICT and our AXT, we did see in a um, dose response manner a significant decrease of um, the production of these cytokines. And, and this did not happen um, when we tested um, the same uh, thing with um, scramble RICT or um, scramble RIXT that are used as negative control. And in gray um, is our positive control. Um, I call them beads. They do, um, are, uh, these are anti-CD28 uh, uh, beads that uh, do activate in, in, in a, a specific manner the, uh, the T cells in order to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. So as I said, um, this, is, this was one of the most prominent cytokines that we tested in this system. Um, many other were tested. And um, we chose the, 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 this technology because um, was uh, for sure higher. Um, uh, 
it has uh, a better sensitivity compared to um, other uh, technology that we have used in the lab. Um, so we, we were able to, to save some time because we were able to multiplex different cytokines at the same time, reducing um, cost and labor. Um, we did have reproducible results. And uh, what was very important for us, also for the, for the next um, um, experiments that we did in, in, um, in human cells that I will show you in a moment, um, it did require a very low uh, sample volume, which, which was um, something that we were looking for. Uh, and also the fact that we could customize uh, the kits that we were using was very important. And in, in this specific case, we did try uh, also um, ELISA and Western blot analysis to, to start this screening, but uh, we, we got better results using uh, this technology. So again, in, in, in the next phase, um, we were then convinced that um, these molecules were uh, promising enough to be used in a, in a mouse model. And um, what we used was a humanized uh, transgenic um, <coughs> HLADQ8 mouse model. Um, these mice um, were made uh, in a way that they are knockout for the immune MHC class 2, so they don't uh, express it. Uh, all their uh, antigen presenting cells express uh, human HLADQ8. The um, problem with this um, model is that um, it does not develop diabetes or hyperglycemia, so um, we can only induce this cell activation. But, but still, it, it was important for us because uh, it can still be used uh, to study the role of HLADQ8 in uh, type 1 diabetes. So <coughs> as I mentioned, the, um, the um, the induction of the T cell activation in this model was, um, was done in this way. So these mice were injected twice uh, with the peptide of interest, so in this case, in Sabina 23, uh, at day one in CFA and day eight in IFA. And then after um, at day 17, mice were sacrificed and uh, the T cell uh, were isolated. And then um, we did a recall response using the, the same peptide in order to um, check the cell activation with our molecules. But the very first thing that we did was, of course, to, um, to test that we had in our hands the, the right model. So as you can see here, this model is called the B6DQ8. Um, they do express, um, in terms of genomic DNA, the, the transgene DQ8. And we also checked by flow that um, there was a, a correct expression of the um, human HLA-DQ8 uh, protein, which, um, which it was. So um, in order to, to check that we um, were able to um, decrease um, significantly the production of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that um, Induce then uh, beta cell death during the early phases of type 1 diabetes. We uh, we did use several assay. I just wanted to show you one of them. This is an Elispot assay, in which we um, we show that um, in our system, uh, when you only um, challenge the the T cells isolated from these mice within CBN 23, you are able to see a huge, a significant production of two of the most prominent uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines in this system, which are interleukin-2 and interferon-gamma. But then, um, when we um, used RICT or RIEXT, uh, this uh, production was decreased significantly, as you can see in the bottom uh, part here. Um, and uh, um, I want to mention that um, these results were also confirmed by, by Luminex assay, and we, we did confirm these also in, in, uh, in terms of other pro-inflammatory cytokines, but those two were the most uh, consistent ones. And then, uh, at the same time, we also started to test um, 
these molecules in, in a system that we we thought was the mm, closest system uh, before going to a phase one uh, clinical trial um, because we, we really wanted a proof of concept in in um, in cells isolated from um, patients with type 1 diabetes. So what we did uh, was to, we, we created a protocol in which we enrolled a patient with a recent onset of type 1 diabetes. And when I say recent onset is, um, a um, diagnosis of diabetes within <coughs> three years. And, and that is because we really want to maximize the, um, the, uh, the chance that we can see T cell activation in these patients. So what we did was to enroll the patient, we harvest the blood, um, then we isolated PBMCs from the blood of, of these patients. The PBMCs were then um, genotyped by a I would say complicated, <laughs> different PCR systems. Um, and then in, in patients that do, um, that did express uh, HLEDQ8, uh, that is mostly, I would say before, between 50, 60% of patients, but <clears throat> I can tell you that the majority of our patients have at least so, in the range of 95, 98%, they do express at least one um, HLA-DQ8 or HLA-DQ2 allele, with the most prominent uh, genotype um, being the heterozygous patient that has uh, HLA-DQ8 and HLA-DQ2. So in, in, in these patients, what we did was uh, a, something similar uh, of, of what we did in mice, um, we did a recall response um, in T cells isolated uh, from, from, from the blood of this patient, adding in SBN23 with and without the, um, the molecules that were tested in vitro, so RICT and RIXT. And um, in order to evaluate the ability of these uh, peptides to block T cell activation, we mainly again use um, Luminex XA. And here, um, again, in the interest of time, I will just show you two of the um, cytokines uh, that we um, analyzed. Um, so again, um, interleukin-2 and interferon-gamma, they went significantly up when the cells were um, treated uh, in this recall response with insulin 23 And we did see a significant uh, decrease in the production of both cytokines and many other uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines when um, the RICT and the RIEXT um, were used. That did not happen uh, when the um, negative scramble RICT and RIEXT uh, were added to the mix. And um, I forgot to mention that um, as negative um, control patients, uh, we have used patients with a um, very long duration of type 1 diabetes, so a patient that have a duration uh, longer than um, 10 years. And you can see here, um, okay, I don't know if you can see, but uh, in the control of the both figures, um, this patient did not show any um, T cell activation, so any production of interleukin-2 and interferon gamma. And this for us was a very important um, tool uh, that convinced us that uh, initial clinical trial, because that is what we wanted to you know, do in the end, uh, would be mm, very important to mm, to start in, in, in HLA-DQ8 patient with a new or a very recent diagnosis of uh, type 1 diabetes. So at this point, um, I do want to mention that uh, at this stage of, the, of this study, um, these molecules were um, uh, patented and um, some of these data were also published and we were approached by the um, Elmsley um, Foundation that was very interested in these studies and wanted to help us to do some of the, um, what is called um, investigation new drug enabling studies. 
uh, that are almost impossible to do if you are an academic institution because you have to also do it in monkeys. So with the help of the um, Southwest Research Institute and of course the funding from Helmsley and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, we started these, um, these studies both in mice and in monkeys. And um, again, I, I will not have time to, to go over the, the, the study that uh, were done, but, but, but those studies are still ongoing because we want to um, go to the FDA with this proposal in about one year. So mainly what was done was pharmacokinetic studies, um, what is called maximum tolerated dose studies, and uh, no observed adverse effect uh, level studies. Uh, we also are trying to develop the, um, the right formulation uh, for the administration to, to patients, of course. And um, what was also interesting to me was to then um, understand what was the mechanism behind the, the underlying uh, retro inverso peptide effect. And I do have some preliminary data that I want to share with you that are unpublished. But this was to say that um, during these studies, we realized that in terms of blood stability and in terms of um, pharmacokinetic studies, um, one of these peptides was better than the other. It often happened in, in, in these kind of studies. We, we also wanted to, to look for the best peptide because we wanted to go to the FDA with the, um, the best molecule, so only with one, one molecule. So to make a long story short, the, the, the best peptide among the molecules that were tested in vitro and ex vivo so far was the RICT. So this was the peptide that was then used um, in vivo in, uh, in, uh, in different models of mice. And then and that we want to move forward to a phase one clinical trial. So again, in the, um, in the, um, during the phase four, um, what uh, we did was to test the RICT in an in vivo system. So these mice uh, that are the same mice that were used in ex vivo, so those are humanized uh, transgenic mice that express uh, only the human HLADQ8 but are knocked out for the murine uh, MHC class two molecule. These mice were um, injected twice with um, the peptide of interest, again, in this case, is in SBINA 23, in order to generate uh, T cell activation. So at day one and at day eight, uh, mice were injected with in SBINA 23, again, with uh, CFA uh, and IFA. Uh, and then between those two injections, between day one and day eight, uh, we did um, give to the mice generally IP, but we did try several um, methods of uh, administration um, with um, RICT. So at day four and day seven and day 11 and 14, uh, RICT or a control uh, negative peptide, generally what we use as a negative peptide is the scramble version of this peptide. So mm, does have the same amino acid, but in a scramble um, sequence. And uh, um, what we found was then, um, again, um, using the, um, the Luminex technology, we um, isolated the T cells uh, from, from these mice. The, the T cells were uh, challenged with uh, INTS B923. Um, we did not add, again, the RICT or the control peptide because both peptides were given in vivo. And um, we did see um, among a, a panel of uh, 25 uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, we used the, the, um, the interleukin 17 uh, panels. Um, I'm showing you nine of them that are um, significantly decreased or um, increased. And we did find again that interleukin 2 and interferon gamma were significantly decreased uh, under this treatment. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, also um, interleukin 1, 17, 21, as you can see here, 22, 23, and 33, and interferon gamma were decreased. But what was very um, 
interesting to us, and we did not expect it, was that um, one of the um, anti-inflammatory cytokines, the interleukin-10, was um, upregulated. And um, we know that um, we were in, this was interested, interesting to us because we know that this cytokine is produced under uh, energy intolerance and is able to dampen the, the immune response. So um, it, 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 it was important for us to, to think that we um, may be able to then, with this treatment, dampen the, the anti-inflammatory response, but uh, well, dampen the inflammatory response, but also increase the anti-inflammatory response. These, uh, these data are not published, so uh, we are still working on them, uh, but we were excited to see this. And then, um, in the last phase, we, we wanted to see um, what happened um, when, um, when we used our treatment in, in vivo, but in a model of type 1 diabetes. So we used a, a model of type 1 diabetes that is, for those of you that are not familiar uh, with this model, is the um, NOD uh, mouse model. It's a very well uh, established model in type 1 diabetes. Um, another reason that we choose this model is because uh, the, the, the crystal stru structure of the um, MHC class 2 um, is very similar to the human HLADQ8. So uh, the, the, the um, MHC class 2 of these mice is able to hold the insulin 23 uh, very well. So in a similar, a similar manner of what happened in, um, in vivo in patients that do express the human HLADQ8. So briefly, what we did was to um, treat the mice. Um, again, this is unpublished, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm just showing uh, some of the preliminary data that we obtained from this study. But um, what we did was to treat um, three times per week uh, these mice with um, an amount of RICT that was um, <coughs> the equivalent uh, to uh, 10 milligram per kilogram. And this amount was um, found in the pharmacokinetic studies. Uh, so mice were treated with uh, RICT or with a, again with a scramble uh, RICT as a control peptide uh, three times per week. And, um, and the study was completed at 28 weeks in 20 mice. So 10 mice got the RICT, 10 mice got the um, control peptide. Um, so th this might have a um, um, median age for the onset of type 1 diabetes that is between 18 and 20 weeks, and they, they don't really survive after 30 weeks of age. So, um, and I'm just talking about female mice because m for male mice it's a totally different um, thing. So we only use female mice in, 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 in this uh, study. Um, and it, it, they, uh, between um, 25 and 30 weeks, m between 95 and 98 uh, uh, percent of mice do develop um, type 1 diabetes. So the first thing, of course, that we wanted to see was, okay, are we able to slow down the progression of beta cell death and then the, the, mm, the diabetes um, incidence in these mice? And uh, the answer is yes. So as you can see here from this carbon mayer curve, um, the, the diabetes incidence uh, in mice that were treated with our molecule significantly decreased. So we had 80% of control mice <coughs> that did develop um, type 1 diabetes by, and I'm talking about um, by the end of the study, so which is 28 um, weeks, uh, versus the 40% of mice that do develop type 1 diabetes in the, in the treatment group. And this was for us very, very promising. But as I said, as I anticipated in the beginning, I really wanted to dig in a little bit into the mechanism because, okay, we are happy that we are slowing down, slowing down the process, so 
probably most likely beta cell death is, is prevented or significantly decreased. So we were convinced that we could move forward and bring this to a phase one clinical trial. But I also wanted to see what was going on at uh, a molecular level, ideally. So <coughs> the first thing that we did was to uh, suck these mice um, at the, uh, at the uh, in the middle of the treatment, because I wanted to see what was going on in the beginning of the, the phases of, of the type 1 diabetes. And as you can appreciate here uh, in this um, HNA staining, um, we did find that the T cell infiltration of islets in uh, mice that were treated with RICT was significantly decreased. And um, also in um, tunnel assay, um, for those of you that are not familiar with this uh, assay, it, it does um, identify uh, the, the, the cells that are dying. So in this case, you have to check the, the red dot. Um, in control mice, uh, there was a significant increase in the very early phases of the disease of um, beta cell death compared to the mice that were um, undergoing the, the treatment with um, RICT. And that confirmed our hypothesis that this treatment was indeed um, slowing down the, um, the onset of diabetes and hyperglycemia because we were preventing and delaying the, the, the death of beta cells. So again, in, um, in vivo, um, what we found uh, in the, um, again in the early phases of the disease, and I'm talking about uh, mice that were um, sucked at uh, 15, between 15 and 18 um, weeks. So as I said, the, the median age of the onset of type 1 diabetes <coughs> is, is around this, uh, this age. So in, in the beginning of, of, the, of, the, um, of the disease, what we found was that in um, mice that were treated with um, our molecule, the RICT, we found, and this is a representative image of many of them, um, we found that islets were, um, were more preserved, were larger, and um, there was a significantly higher expression of uh, insulin compared to the, the, the image on, on the left uh, that um, has a very lower um, amount of, um, of insulin. And, um, and we also wanted to see what was going on in, uh, in terms of the, of the T cells that were um, infiltrated the, the, the islets of these mice. And uh, um, we were able to, um, to confirm what was our hypothesis, the initial hypothesis, uh, that um, there was less beta cell death because we um, were also decreasing the amount of um, CD8, so cytotoxic T cells, that uh, were infiltrating the, the pancreas of these mice. So you can appreciate that there is a significant um, lower uh, amount of CD8 positive cells on the um, on the right, so in mice that were uh, treated with uh, RICT. And then um, we um, kept mice, of course, for a longer period, because we wanted to see what was going on during the, the, um, the uh, more mature phases of the, of the disease. And uh, um, you, you, you can see that in control mice, almost uh, all the islets basically di disappear because uh, when um, these mice develop uh, severe hyperglycemia and develop type 1 diabetes, they almost have no uh, beta cell left. Uh, but with RICT, we were able to preserve some of these islets, and you could see uh, in the, on the right in the enlarged image that uh, there was, again, a significant um, a higher amount of insulin in mice that were uh, treated with RICT compared to control mice. But also what was striking to us was that um, in, uh, in, the, in the treatment, um, 
we did see some infiltration um, in mice. So this was different um, compared to what we see in the early phases of the disease because we almost saw no infiltration in, in mice under treatment with our ICT. And then we, we decided to investigate what was the nature of these uh, T cells that were infiltrated the pancreas. We had some ideas on, on this, but we wanted to confirm it. <coughs> And again, um, those are preliminary data not published that I'm sharing with you, but we, um, we did see um, in some of these mice the, the increased um, um, production of, uh, of T cells, infiltration of T cells that were positive for FOXP3 in mice that were treated with uh, our molecule of interest. So it was very exciting for us because that uh, confirmed the fact that we were um, doing, we were dampening the anti-inflammatory response, but we, we were also doing some, something, we, we were, um, Yes, we were dampening the pro-inflammatory response, but we were also doing something in terms of the, the T regulatory cells. And again, I mean, we, we, we need to confirm this, but it looks like the, um, the RICT is increasing the infiltration of T regulatory cells in the pancreas of these mice. So uh, with that, I, I hope I didn't bore you too much, and I... Um, I convince you that we, um, we have a novel strategy in, in which we discover a promising uh, retroinverso peptide that is able to block antigen presentation in different models uh, that are relevant to type 1 diabetes. So I want to remind you that we, we did this screening um, in vitro in uh, using a human HLADQ8 made in a baculovirus system, and we also did it um, in uh, using um, human cells expressing human HLADQ8 and um, engineer uh, T cells expressing a human T cell receptor that is able to be activated only when insulin 23 is presented by the human HLADQ8. We did also do the validation uh, ex vivo in a mouse model of um, diabetes and in isolated cells from patients with diabetes. And of course, the, the last data that I show you in vivo in, in uh, different model of type 1 diabetes. Um, we, we, we believe that this is a novel approach that is um, mainly a targeted form of therapy because it would uh, ideally block the activation of only of DQ8 restricted diabetogenic T cells without causing a broad um, immune suppression, which is something that we believe is a very important unmet need. Um, this is, uh, can also be expanded in patients with outer autoimmune disease that are associated with uh, different HLA DQ8 allele, uh, for example, DR3 and DQ8, um, that are mainly gene um, underlying autoimmune thyroiditis and celiac disease. And I also, I don't want to mention that we are um, expanding these experiments also to patients that um, are uh, positive for DQ8 because, as I said, the most prominent genotype of patients with type 1 diabetes is a HLA-DQ2, HLA-DQ8 uh, genotype. So we want to really um, try to treat the majority of patients uh, with, with, with this strategy. Um, and with that, I, this is my last uh, slide. I think it's also the most important one because I really want to, want to thank my, especially my mentor that um, gave me the, of course, the opportunity to, to uh, finish this project, uh, publish it, and uh, part of it. Um, and especially my primary mentor of my uh, K uh, award, that is um, Professor Yaron Tomer, and its lab that helped me with the majority of um, experiments uh, that I just presented uh, to you. Uh, all my collaborator and advisor, especially uh, Gaetano Santulli from Albert Einstein, uh, and Dr. Roman Osman from uh, Mount Sinai that uh, did mainly um, the um, in silico studies. 
uh, of course, my um, my fundings, um, the the um, especially the Helmsley Foundation that is helping us to to bring these uh, hopefully to the clinics and help patients, and of course uh, Luminex that uh, gave me the opportunity to be here today with you, and um, I'll be happy to answer any question if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Otoko. So I'm interested in your IL-10 data aggregated in the RICT. Yes. So do you have any idea what's the source of IL-10 and how you know, RICT induced, uh, I think uh, you, you saw the FOXP3 uh, T-Rex cell aggregated? Maybe yes. they produce IL-10, I guess. <laughs> but uh, what's the relationship between the RICT and uh, IL-10 production? Um, I, I didn't get the last question. What was the relationship between RICT and? Yeah, what's the mechanism? Oh, how how yeah. RICT induces the <laughs> idea? Yeah, that, that is a very good question, and um, I wish I can have the answer for that because I, I really want to investigate what, what were the pathway involved in this. So the way this, um, yeah, I, I basically didn't go really into deep because I didn't have time, but the way these uh, peptides work is um, they, they replace the binding between the INSBIN and 23. And of course, you can use them for other peptides like GAD65, for example. If you, if you use retroinversal peptides that are um, made using a GAD65 is a parental peptide. Um, but um, so they, they replace the binding between INSBIN and 23 and um, HLADQ8, right? So, they are supposed to then dampen the, the T-cell activation, but we were really not sure why. Okay, so, so you could understand, you have an hypothesis, right? How the, the CD8 cells are going down. But we could really not uh, understand what was the, 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 the link. We, we were just excited to see that we had more um, FOXP3 positive cells. So uh, because I had a little bit of money from, from Helmsley, I think I will, what I want you to do in these mice is to do some RNA-seq and probably some um, single cell RNA-seq to just understand what is you know, the pathway involved and, 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 and go uh, deeper into the mechanism because, I mean, in terms of mechanism, we don't know. I, in the beginning, we were just happy to, to see that it was working, so we really didn't care about, you know, what was the mechanism because we just wanted to go to the FDA saying, okay, this is slowing uh, down beta cell death mm -hmm. in mice and in several, you know, ex vivo and in vitro systems. So, I mean, we, we, we have enough data to, to move it forward to the phase one, but now, I mean, I'm really curious to, to see what could be the mechanism and... Uh, but I mean, yeah, that's a very pertinent question. Probably one of the reviewers will ask us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, um, my name is Shego. I'm in Genentech. And I'm trying to understand your Nord mouse model. Um, when you started treating, what, at what age were the mice when you started treating them? Because I couldn't see it from your slides. I was trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mention that. And yes. then how often did you treat them? And how durable was the response? Or the, I know you stopped at 28 days, I believe. Uh, no, 12, um, 30 weeks, right? So at that stage, um, you said about 50% of the mice were still alive, right? Yes. How did it, did it stay that way even without treatment or things okay, changed? Okay, so let's uh, first, uh, okay, so I already forgot your first, let's start okay. with the first question. The first question is when, okay, when, when we, start? uh, we started the treatment. So we, we wanted to start the treatment as early as we could to maximize, because uh, we didn't, we had no idea what, you know, was our result, right? So just to maximize the chances that the treatment was working. So these mice were um, treated when they were just um, 
uh, when we weaned them from the mothers, so I'm talking about mice that were between four and six weeks old, and um, we did treat them um, three times per week. So the half-life of, um, of this specific peptide is around uh, 12 hours. So, but, but we didn't want to stress the mice, you know, too much and treat them like every day. But, but we are now doing um, like a different experiment. So uh, that I think it's also very interesting because we want them to, to get type 1 diabetes and then start the treatment. Because we wanted to see if we can slow down, prevent it, but then also do something that is a treatment for them. I, I don't have I mean, any data yet uh, confirming this, but that was uh, what we wanted to do after this. And the other question, yeah, so mice um, that were treated uh, had a longer survival day, a rate, um, but they, they did start developing hyperglycemia uh, after, I would say, probably a month. So when they develop uh, severe hyperglycemia, then they die. So we, we are really working to, to try a different protocol, like increasing a little bit the dosage or maybe trying to, to give them more often the peptide. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope I answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's you did. Okay. Yeah, you. appreciate it. Hello. Um, I had a question. Have you ever looked at whether there's a reduction of pancreas reactive T cells in these not mice after treating them with uh, um, the peptide? Um, you mean um, cytotoxic uh, T cells or what kind of cells? T cells? Yeah, basically, if there's a reduction in the, site, in the um, amount of T cells that is reactive to the insulin derived peptide your index peptide oh, after okay, treating. Oh, okay, okay, so because heart. I did show that we had a reduction in, um, so, okay, in, in these mice, what we saw was a reduction of T cells, uh, CD8 positive cells, and CD4, which I didn't show here, CD4 positive cells that were infiltrating the pancreas, but I'm not sure if they are directed toward the, that will be a little bit more complicated assay, but I mean, that's a very interesting suggestion. So we don't know if we have less um, specific T cells against uh, that particular peptide. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.